Ephesians chapter 4. Still there, still there. In case some of y'all haven't been around in a while, we're still here. Ephesians 4, let's start reading in verse 1 again. I bet some of y'all, hopefully by now, are starting to memorize these six verses. But, uh, but let's read. And he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Uh, Did y'all know, are y'all ready for this revelation? This is going to blow your minds, okay? But I want you to listen very carefully. And I don't know if you picked this up in verse 6. But did you know there is one God? Let me say it like this. Did you know there is one deity? That's all you get. One. One deity. Now, here's what I... This is really good timing. um, And I wish I could take credit and say that I really planned this thing to work out this way where this passage would fall on Halloween. Um, That is totally not my doing. I don't plan these things out. In fact, I try to just stretch it out as long as I can to make y'all suffer. But here we are. Verse 6... Today we're going to talk about one God, and I think it is perfect because, again, there's a lot of people these days uh, today that are going to be participating in a lot of Halloween festivities and those sorts of things, and many of them are doing so without much knowledge about the origins of Halloween. So I want to talk about that real briefly, and there's a reason why. Halloween, as we call it today, um, has its origins, believe it or not, dating all the way back to the time that Jesus walked the earth. Dating back even to the time when the Apostle Paul was on his missionary journeys. Did y'all know that? Pretty incredible. Many of us think of it as just sort of a modern thing in history, but in fact it goes all the way back. Um, But in that day and time, and we have seen this even in the book of Ephesians, there were diversities of religions all over the world. I mean... You know, pagan religions, monotheistic religions, polytheistic religions. There's all kinds of religion and belief systems all over the place. And, uh, and what happened is in the European region, reaching all the way from what we call Ireland today, all the way down into France, there was a group of people known as the, I guess you say Celts. I don't know if it's Celts or Celts. C-E-L-T-S. How would y'all pronounce that? Emma, how would you pronounce that? You're, very, you're a very wise one. Celts, like, k- k- okay, all right, so Celts, but see, it's funny, then we say the Celtics, right? So what gives? What's the rule there? <laughs> well, you just, hey, if you need to know, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know, right? Thank you. Uh, so just so y'all are aware, it's Celtic, not Celtic. It's the Balton Celtics, okay? All right, all them Boston people got it wrong, right? But nonetheless, so there were these Celtic people, the Celts, and uh, every year their New Year started on November the 1st. November 1st was their New Year, okay? Now, November 1st for them marked the end of the summer, the growing and the harvesting season, okay? And it marked the beginning of the winter time, which for them was a, just like it is for us, it's a cold, dark period of the year. Now, this was a time associated with death. The winter season was. And so it was believed that on the night before New Year's, which would have been October the 31st, okay, um, the ghosts of the dead would return to earth. That is a belief that the Celts had. All right? So on October 31st, the ghosts of the dead will return to earth. Now what would happen is they believed as these ghosts of the dead returned to earth, 
they would wreak all kinds of havoc, one of which was death. They would kill and destroy and just cause all kinds of trouble. This particular celebrate or this particular day, October 31st, they, they called it Sal'in, is how you pronounce it. it it's, if you look at the spelling, it's spelled Samhain, but the way you pronounce it is Sal'in. Sounds very close to Halloween, okay? But it was called Sal'in. And so, uh, again, um, they believe these ghosts of the dead would just wreak all kinds of havoc. Now, the other part of this is the, the Celts' priest, who are called Druids, okay? The Druids would build these massive bonfires on October 31st. And they would gather around, and what would happen is the Celts would gather together, they would burn their crops, they would sacrifice animals to their gods, and they had many gods that they believed in. Okay, And they also used this as a time to, for the Druids to issue prophecies about the coming future because they could have contact with the ghosts of the dead. This is the origin of, of Halloween. And so um, the other thing that would happen is when they would come and they would observe Sa'in, they would dress up in costumes. They would wear animal heads and animal skins. And the reason they dressed up was to, in no uncertain terms, fool the ghosts of the dead um, and, I guess, deter them from injuring them. And so they would dress up in disguise. And so you can obviously see the roots of the current Halloween traditions um, uh, through this Sal'in. Now, um, round about the 8th century, uh, you had the Catholic Pope, Pope Gregory of all people, Gregory III. Um, by the way, the name Gregory means watchful one. Um, and, and it literally comes from this idea of watching out for the devil, which I find really interesting. And it was Pope Gregory III, a Roman Catholic Pope, who really kind of took this to a new level. And, um, and on, he designated October 31st as All Hallows' Eve. The Protestants eventually took that tradition and they wanted to sort of grapple it away from the Catholics, the Roman Catholics. And they called it All Saints Day because they were just trying to memorialize the dead. Uh, but nonetheless, it was all built upon this Celtic tradition of Sal'in and this hiding from ghosts. And it was a pagan tradition. And it was a pagan tradition based upon many deities. Today, we call it Halloween. Now... As a Christian, listen carefully, as a believer, I'm not saying you cannot have candy on Halloween. So everybody relax. Gene, you can eat your spiderweb candy that another Christian made for you. Okay, that's okay. I'm not saying you can't have candy on Halloween. In fact, over the centuries, as we've kind of discussed, Christians have done everything they can to sort of or attempted to cover up the pagan, pagan traditions of Halloween. But you can still eat the candy. I want you all to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In this context, in this vein of thought, I want you to, I want you to read this passage. And maybe this will help put... A new skin on this passage, I guess you could say. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Again, I'm, this isn't an attempt to guilt anybody if you're going to you know, participate in the festivities of Halloween. Okay? I'm not, I'm not attempting to do that. I do want to redirect our focus a bit, though. Um, you can't eat the candy. can't eat the candy. It's okay. You might get a cavity or two. You might get an upset stomach if you eat too much like my kids do. They sit down and eat 10 pounds at a sitting. You know what I mean? It's like, and then throw up, you know? But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, come with me to verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. We know that, right? Pause. We know that, right? Even though the world may use these candies in celebration of something other than what we believe is the truth and is the truth, and that is one God, it's just to us, it's candy. Isn't it? It's sugar. 
It's delicious. <laughs> and it will make you fat and toothless. Okay? Um, but get, keep reading. It says, for, for though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there, uh, as there be gods many and idols many, but to us there is but one God. The world's going to look and say, hey, there's a lot of gods, a lot of deities. A lot of things we need to pay homage to. Uh, we know better than that, right? That's what Paul's saying here. But to us, there's but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in Him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by Him. Now, he's speaking to believers there. I, I, I'm, that passage, I just want you to understand, I, I do believe, at least scripturally, we do have some foundation to be able to say, eat the candy. Eat the candy. I would add to that in moderation. Um, it's probably a wise thing, okay? I would not advise you eat the candy in celebration of pagan gods or of the dead. I would not recommend that. Um, what does Paul later on say? He says, uh, what fellowship um, does light have with darkness? What fellowship does Christ have with Belial or an idol? Zero. That's the answer. Right? But certainly we shouldn't observe it in that mindset. But um, notice, come back to, um, uh, where is it at? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I just lost it. Paul there says, though, take heed. Take heed. Um, that candy does not belong to some deities. There's only one God, one deity. And so we need to take heed when we partake. If you eat the Halloween candy, we say it's Halloween candy. It's just candy. Um, we shouldn't lose our minds at Halloween. And don't, don't get so lost in this stuff that you just lose your mind. And certainly don't lose control at Halloween. And that means lose sight of the truth and lose sight of our calling. Now, here's our calling. Just in case you forgot, go back to Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4, look with me at verse 1. Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you do what? Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. The calling that you are called to is the hope of glory. That is a joyful and confident expectation of the rapture and of our heavenly inheritance of all the spiritual blessings we've been blessed with in Christ. Walk worthy of it. In other words, walk and look and act like a Christian. Don't lose your mind at Halloween in the name of some deities that don't even exist. Don't go crazy, right? Because we know there's only one God. Um, you know, what's beautiful about this, when I, when I kind of give this advice, or I you know, call on Scripture here in this calling of being walking worthy of the vocation, we're worth a call, we have a perfect example of what this looks like in the Bible. So I want you all to turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Now, you and I know, because we rightly divide the word of truth, you and I are to follow the Apostle Paul, his manner of life and doctrine, his teaching, right? Because that's like, for example, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ, right? And so we understand that. I want you to watch as Paul sets an example of what it looks like to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Okay, And we see this um, in Acts chapter 17. Paul comes up to this place in Athens called Mars Hill. Okay, It's a big rock called the Areopagus. And it's where the Greeks would worship all kinds of gods and deities. And they had monuments and memorials to all these various deities. And Paul comes on the scene here. Okay, And just watch what he does. Start in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. You know, tonight we're going to see people in all kinds of crazy costumes and, and weird goings on, all right? And, and we're going to perceive there's a lot of superstition, right? Because there, there is. There's a lot of superstitions out there. So much like Paul, we're going to see this. And he says, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an, uh, an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. 
Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device." And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but, not, uh, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, and that He hath raised Him from the dead. You know, one of the things I want you to notice here, Paul comes into this scene of crazy religious, this crazy religious environment. And there's all this superstitious religious activity, much of it done in ignorance. And Paul comes into that scene, and what he does is he walks worthy of the vocation wherewith he is called. And you know what he does? He takes the opportunity to share the truth. Not apologetically. Do you know that? Did you notice that when he shares, he begins to preach and teach these people who are completely lost and off the map? He's not trying to defend the existence of God, is he? He's not a philosopher here. He just throws out the truth. It's up to them to either believe or deny it, right? I think too many times as Christians, what happens amidst this world that we live in, we get too defensive about our faith and we feel like it's our job to prove to everybody that this thing is real. And we actually kind of cheapen it when we do that. I am certain that God is fully capable of demonstrating to the heart of any man, woman, or child His real existence and His real love. On that note, I want to share a quick story with you about the reality of God's existence. Not in an apologetic tone, but just this is just a personal anecdote. There was a time in my life... I struggled deeply and personally and privately, went through a very dark depression. This was when I was in college in Mississippi State. I was in philosophy and taking a bunch of just liberal, stupid, garbage courses. And I was constantly being just inundated and hammered with garbage. And that's just what it was. It was garbage. I wish I could get my money back. I might stop paying my student loans. I'm kidding. But anyway, so... Um, so I'm sitting there in class day after day getting hammered. And my faith is just... It's, it's wearing down to the point of depression, to the point of just wanting to give up. And I remember one night I went to my room and, and of all the things I finally just kind of, it, it sort of wore me down to and I realized the only thing I could really turn to for any kind of answer was God's Word. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm telling you all, this Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword and it can cut through all the garbage and find that little itch down inside and scratch it. Trust me. And I can remember getting in the floor of my room and just, I'll be honest with y'all, in that moment, I wasn't so sure God even did exist anymore because my faith was so worn down. So I cried out. And this is what I said, I said God, if you are real, how in the world can I know it? Is there anything I can feel, see, or measure, or just somehow really know it. And of all places, I was led to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It wasn't like this voice from heaven. It wasn't one of those things I was not sitting and, you know, and humming and all this. It wasn't that. Um, in fact, I think I was doing a little devotional at the time and just kind of, it just happened to be the next Bible verse. And it came to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Now, this is not necessarily a proper interpretation of the passage, but I believe with all of my heart that the Holy Spirit used it to really convince me. And he, do, he uses His Word in that way. But 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, Now abide these three, th these three things, faith, hope, and love. 
Now, at that point in my existence, I had come to the place that if I was going to believe that God was real, it all hinged upon and it all came down to the idea that I just had to believe. I just had to have faith that He was there, whether I could prove Him or not. So it all came down to me hanging on to God. It was all about my strength. But do you all know what the last part of 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says? It says, Now abide these three things, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is not faith. It doesn't come down to your faith. It doesn't come down to your hope. Your joyful and confident expectation of something that's coming down the pike. It doesn't come down to you. What's the greatest of those three things? Love. And you know what your Bible says? God is love. For the first time in my life, I, I, it, it dawned on me, you know what? I know for a fact, love is something I have experienced. Love is for real. Love is solid. It is unshakable. And don't I have ample evidence to see that God has reached out to me in love? And then, poof, the doubt was gone. What's amazing is how the faith came flooding in. How the hope was bolstered. Because of the love of God. Now, the reason why I'm saying all this and going th through sort of this story is... I am fully confident that God is able, even in these people that you just think are lost as a goose in a hailstorm and are so far off the mark that it couldn't possibly be that they would ever see the light of day. You think, man, there's got to be some way I've got to convince them of the reality of God Himself before they'll even believe. No, you don't. The Holy Spirit can prick the heart of man so much more effectively, powerfully, and efficiently than we might ever do with any summation of words. And so what we ought to do is follow the example of the Apostle Paul, just like he did there on Mars Hill, and just lay it out there. Just lay it out there. Michael? Yeah, absolutely. He's already demonstrated his, even his Godhead, right? His invisible attributes are clearly seen, right? And so, just lay it out there. Beware of this, though. You're going to be rejected. You'll, you'll be more rejected than you will be accepted. Uh, Jeremy over here is a salesman. He's a great salesman, by the way, and I can tell this because he's very personable. He doesn't necessarily work on a script. I can so see this. He just kind of... Jeremy, I, if y'all haven't met Jeremy yet, it's really easy to get known because he's just a likable guy. And, and, and so what I, the reason why I'm bringing you up in this is when you, when you think about sales, a lot of times um, we think we have to convince people. But a lot of times it's just about that relationship. And I've seen, you know, where in a sales relationship, if you just kind of just talk, just talk, to build a relationship. It's amazing how you can have those opportunities, right? And so... Um, but, but, but God has that ability to connect with people. And I don't think we have to do that. So if we follow the example of the Apostle Paul, I believe we too can be effective in that. Um, but you know, when we go back to Ephesians 4 now, Ephesians chapter 4, one God, that is one deity, is an essential and foundational belief that we hold as Christians. And if, especially if we're going to keep the unity of the Spirit, we've got to uphold that doctrine of one God. Um, now, along with this, I want you to notice, come back to Ephesians 4, verse 6. He says, One God and Father of all. Now, the reason why I stress that word and is because it is a separate thought. Albeit connected to this this entity, this deity known as God, there is something about this deity that is unique. And it is that He is Father of all. Those two are connected. And, and so, in other words, everything that exists has its genesis because of God. This God is a Father of all. He is the initiator of all. In philosophy, we call this the first cause or the primary causer, if you will, okay? And so nothing exists unless the first dude does what he does. He is the father of what? All, okay? Um, Y'all go back with me to Genesis chapter 1. So 
The one God that you and I worship and that we serve, that we believe in, that we hold to, is a God that is the Father of all. That's unique about Him. Let's just read here, and I want you all to do this with me. Somebody help me. Leaf, this is so your wheelhouse, okay? You ready? Every time I say the word God or Lord, count it. You're just going to keep a count. You're not like ADD, man. You need to stay with me, okay, Leaf? All right. So every time I say God or Lord, you got to count it. And at the end of this, I want you to tell me how many we came to. And the reason why is I want you to understand something. Who is responsible here? Who is the first actor? Okay? Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said... Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, And the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. In the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created uh, great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. After their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas. And let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that He had made. And behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. We're not finished! Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, 
God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it He had rested from all His work from which God created and made. Alright, Leaf, what'd you come up with? 36. 36 times we get either God or Lord. I, did we, we didn't have Lord, did we? But we had some pronouns, some he's and him's. You won't even count those. If you counted those, we'd be probably at 50. You were tempted. Emma, did you count them? Oh, I, I thought for sure you were checking him. I knew you were. Okay. But, are you, I mean, look, I know there were a lot of tangents there. I could just see Rita's mind when I was reading that. Bing, bing, boom. Oh, I want to go down that path. I want to go down that path. I want to go down that path. Michael, you too. I could see it. I could feel it. It was palpable. You could cut the air. That's not the point right now. The point I want you to get, there's one God as Father of all. Ah, I guess technically you could, right? And, and so, here's, here's the thing. Nowhere in there does anything or anybody else get credit, number one, for being God or for creating anything else, right? There, see, this is, this is crucial to our belief system. This is foundational doctrine. We believe in a God that is the God that created literally everything. All. And that's an important concept. Um, y'all go with me to John chapter 1. So we did all that reading in Genesis just then. And we could probably sum it up in this one verse. But just so we have redundancy. John chapter 1. Look with me at verse 3. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Were there any things that existed that were unmade? Just a quick thought. <laughs> uh, well, God Himself. God was unmade. He didn't make Himself. He just is. Eternally, right? I know, there's another little tangent thought and rabbit trail, but nonetheless, uh, go with me to Romans chapter 1. I think, Michael, you, you brought this up just a moment ago, but Romans chapter 1, this casts a little bit of a negative light here, but, but nonetheless, listen to the, this notion that God is Father of all. Okay? Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And in other words, they suppress it. They, 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 it's willful ignorance. It's, it's willful denial of the truth. Verse 19, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even, even, listen, even His eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen by what He has made. Clearly, that's what the Bible says. So that they are without excuse. So even the, the naked you know, village people down there in the Amazon jungle have zero excuse. Right? It's clearly seen, it says here. Go with me to Revelation chapter 4. You know, it's often asked, why... Why would God even initiate this whole thing? Why would He initiate the creation of 
humanity, the world, angelic beings, the visible, the invisible, all this stuff. Why? Well, verse 11, Revelation 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are were created. You know, some of y'all, uh, I had a conversation with a friend this week that's been having some family issues. And, you know, some of us grew up in, in homes where maybe your relationship with your parents wasn't just great. And maybe there were times you didn't feel as though your parents really just enjoyed you being there. <laughs> some of you did. You know, the one God who is Father of all enjoys us. He loves being around us. You know, there are times that come home and, for example, Seth, man, he's just raring to go. He's just, Daddy, you're home! And, and, and I love that. And then the next breath, hey, Daddy, will you fill in the blank? Go throw the baseball, throw that football. And, and it's like, he's, he's, he's calling for me to enjoy him. That's what, it, it, it's not about his skill set. He's calling for me to enjoy Him. You know, God the Father just enjoys you. He, he, just, he, he just thrives in that relationship. And He just did it just because. I mean, that's incredible to think on. Um, I want just a real quick side note. We're about to take a break here in just a second. We've got to be very careful here because when the Bible here says that God is Father of all, okay... There's a distinction that needs to be made. And you need to understand this distinction. And there's a distinction between God as Father of all, that is, Creator, okay? And then on the other side, God is our Father, we, His adopted children. Okay? Let me explain this to you. Um, go with me, uh, well, we'll start in Matthew chapter 5. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Now, Matthew chapter 5. Back in Ephesians, Paul says, God is Father of all. In that context, he's speaking of God in His creative role, in His role as Creator. And so very literally, all of humanity is His creation. Okay, all, He is Father of all that in, in the sense that He made it all. He gave birth to it all, so to speak. Okay? Um, uh, but, but we need to make a distinction between that and those of us who call God Father, as he, Paul says in Romans 8. We cry out to Him, Abba, Father, in the sense that we are now His children. We are blood ball and we are adopted into His family, under, into His household. So there's a big distinction to be made there. Matthew chapter 5, come on down to verse 44. Jesus says, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Now remember, this is under the law. This is Jesus speaking in terms of kingdom law as well. He says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father. Now under the law, there was a degree to which Israel specifically here had to do the works of the law to have this familial relationship with God as their father, as a kindred father at that. Otherwise, he'd be their enemy, right? So under the law, it was a works-based scenario versus under grace, you and I, it's by grace through faith alone, okay? But he, he says there in verse 40, "...that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil..." and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. God, listen, God, He is gracious to all of humanity on some levels. For example, this morning, that sunshine that's making that beautiful weather out there right now is just as provided for, for just as many lost people as it is saved people, with no distinction. That's God's goodness, right? And in, in that very general sense, God is Father of all people. But right here in this room, 
He is our Father in a daddy sense. Everybody outside of faith in Christ does not have that label as we're going to see. Okay? Uh, Go with me to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Notice the condition here to, to be a child. Okay? Um, a child that has God as Father in a real deep relational sense. Verse 36. John chapter 12, verse 36. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. Do you see the condition there? Faith in Christ precedes, goes before the new title, the new relational position between you and God. You see that? All right, go with me to um, Romans chapter 8. Let me say this very bluntly, okay? Unbelievers are not children of God. It feels like a gut punch. We've all been raised to think, oh, everybody's a child of God. Yes, in one sense. Everyone is God's creation. But when we talk about this in terms of a salvation type relationship, a justified relationship, a a relationship of friendship versus enmity, a relationship of peace with God, a a relationship of being reconciled with God, a, a relationship of father to child, okay, that only exists within the body of Christ or within that that faith relationship. Everyone outside does not have that. We're going to see that here. Romans 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, we, that Paul is talking about here, talking to here, are we believers. He's talking to believers. Now, go with me to Galatians chapter 3. Just hang with me. Galatians chapter 3. Take a right turn. Notice this. For ye are all the children of God. How? What does the last part of the verse say? Verse 26. For ye are all the children of God. How? By faith in Christ Jesus. That's the key. That, that, is, that is the signature on the adoption papers. Okay, It is by faith in Christ Jesus that you become then a child of God in that deeper relational sense. Okay, Go with me to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to see the dark side of this here in just a minute, but first, one, one last passage on the light side, I guess you could say. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 5. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. He's speaking here to believers. Now, here's why that's important. Go back with me now to Romans chapter 9. Let's see the dark side. To those who don't believe. Okay? We who do believe are children of the light of the day, children of God, joint heirs with Christ, right? We, we are given a new familial relationship with God. But look at Romans 9 and come with me to verse 8. Romans 9 verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, what does it say next? Do y'all see how the world's philosophies can totally mess you up? 
you can believe some false doctrine. Everybody's a child of God. No, that's not what the Bible tells us. If you're left in your natural, unsaved state, you are a child of God only in the sense that He created you. That's where it ends. To be elevated to a position of child of God in the sense that He is a loving, caring Father that is looking after your every need and has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And to have that deep, abiding relationship, you have to have faith in Christ to become that child of light. Okay? He says, uh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. He's speaking there specifically about Israel. But go with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And look with me at verse 2. Ephesians 2 verse 2. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in what? The children of God? The children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, but fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, that is in our natural state, the children of wrath, even as others. Okay? So, we've got to be careful. When we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6, where it says God is the Father of all, you've got to be careful because there are certain systems of doctrine out there that try to take passages like that and say, everybody's saved, period, carte blanche. No, no conditions. Nobody has to have faith. This is an age of grace. It is so, uh, so effective and so broad and so um, uh, efficient that everybody's saved no matter what. Nobody goes to hell. And there are even systems of doctrine that even go so far as to say those who have gone to hell or some sort of purgatory of some means is going to be resurrected to heavenly existence. And that's not true. That's a complete misunderstanding of this idea of God as Father of all. When Paul says that in Ephesians 4, he's speaking there in terms of God is the creator of all. Okay, But to us who have believed in His Son's work and have trusted that, guess what? We are children of God in a very real sense.